The following is a conversation I had with Volker Ruatinga about his company Vertigo and the work that they are doing in 3D printed concrete. I pulled these images from their website, which is a great place to go if you're interested in seeing more images of their projects for yourself. Hi, how are you doing? You can't hear me. Good? Yep. All right, cool. Wow, so that's the printer behind you. There's one of them, yeah. Yeah, that's incredible. The one's right there. That's really cool. So it's kind of hard to tell from the distance it is behind you, but how tall does it stand? Maybe like four meters, five meters? Oh, wow. That's not bad. So what are the major advantages from the second version compared to the first version? Uh, the second version on track, that's the only real difference. Uh -huh. So the second version has like, an, uh, I think it's a six, six meter track. So that just extends our range from um, on the X axis, you know. I saw before you guys were printing in a box, filling it with gravel while the print was going on. Um, I guess that was to support the print. Can you tell me more about that? So that, that's, it's, it's an interesting um, technique. So that's one of the things we, I, I, some say specialize in. It's been, it's been done before and it's still being done in other, with other printers as well. Now the problem is obviously when you have any angle uh, beyond, you know, five, six, seven, maybe 10 degrees, you, you get a collapsing structure, right? So even with large prints, people use some type of support material. We basically just took that and ran with it. So whenever we, what we like to do is make, you know, extremely difficult objects, right? And we just ran with the supporting material and what ended up happening was we would fill entire molds basically, well not like molds, but just square boxes with the support material in order to get this overhang ready, right? So this is, for, this we just developed, we started using sand in our first project to make a concrete canoe. And we ended up going, uh, just running with the technique and making a lot of design style objects. Wow, that makes a lot of sense. I didn't even consider how much more useful that would be for printing angles. Yeah, and we can, we, we've done uh, like 90 degree angles on the, with this stuff. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's labor intensive, right? But if you want really uh, bizarre shapes, then currently there really isn't any other way to do it. So most people talk about this two and a half D style, right? Uh, where, where it looks like it's three dimensional, but basically it's, it's a curve and then turn on its side or there are some other ways to do it. Um, but this real, this, this support material makes it really 3D. Uh, obviously, in my opinion, it's not useful for very large objects, but when you go for, for a certain scale, then it's, it's, it's very much the way to go. Yeah, sure. So how long have you been working on this project? So I started the company in 2018, so January 2018. Yeah. So yeah, it's been like two years now. Wow. So relatively new. And yeah. how big is your team? We are two of us full time now and uh, two part time um, or some on and off. And we have a small team of interns that work alongside. Uh, but we're also part of a, a consortium, like a group of companies that we're doing one large project together. Uh, that support us a lot as well so we're running right now printing a house and we're doing that with several other companies but the company itself vertico is is just us it's interesting you mentioned that because i've done some research into different construction technology innovations and from what i've seen the most important factor in whether or not an innovation is successful or not is the partnerships that are going into making that innovation happen sure. so i guess i'm assuming you're working with maybe traditional construction companies, yeah. uh, maybe some materials companies? So that's really how it started. I mean, I guess that's interesting as well. Um, that's, how the, that's how the company really started. I was asked a while back in my previous employer, I worked in the automotive industry. Okay. And we were asked by a couple of companies inside the, um, the town where I worked to experiment with 3D concrete printing. They asked us if we could supply them a, um, a robot. And we could yeah. because we had a lot of spare robots. You know, in automotive, there, there's a lot of them. Um, so we had 200 plus robots. So we had some spare, uh, spare part robots. And then I said, we can give you the robot, but I'd like to be involved in the project because I know a lot about 3D printing. Yeah. So it was a construction company and a concrete supplier and two other companies inside our town with some very creative individuals. And then myself, 
uh, they started experimenting. And after about a year, year and a half, I quit my job and started the company. Wow, that's really cool. So you were an automotive manufacturer, kind of. Yeah. And were you responsible for working with the robots that were building the cars? Nope. First project I did, I had absolutely zero experience with robots whatsoever. Wow. So <laughs> now you're kind of a full-on engineer at the company. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you, you asked me the question before, what's my engineering background? And I have zero engineering background. So did you go to university? I did. I have a degree in philosophy. Philosophy. Yeah, very useful. <laughs> well, maybe it was useful in helping you find what you wanted to do. Absolutely. So it's, 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 I mean, I like it. I like the fact that I had a degree like that and it does yeah. make me, a, you know, a creative thinker. I'm not exactly held back by, uh, by the problems that we face. Right. Um, and ended up going to automotive and learning. It was mostly in the, on the management side um, and slowly but surely had some, somewhat more to do with the technical side, the project management side. Uh, but when I jumped from uh, employment to uh, starting the company, I had not, written the robot code once in my life yeah a lot of great entrepreneurs have learned how to do the how to work with the technology that they have as they're building it like i know elon musk is famous for learning all these different engineering like schools without any schooling so he's getting like all this knowledge just from building the product that he's developing for his company rather than how people learn traditionally personally i think people learn much better that way because you're so much more motivated to teach yourself something when you know that it's going to have some direct impact on the printer standing right behind you. Agreed. And, and the first product I did as well was um, uh, we did this concrete canoe for, 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 uh, for a team of students. And uh, as I said, I hadn't written a, a, a line of code, but I also didn't know how to get the robot into its work object. I didn't know how to orient the robot. I didn't know how to make a TCP. I didn't, I didn't know any of that. So I, I, but I really wanted to finish the project. Right? It took me three months to get it done. Yeah. Um, and I learned, I learned by doing. Uh, I, I, it was it was a difficult lesson, right? But I mean, the the, the learning curve was extremely steep. So, so you say concrete canoe. There's no way you can make a concrete canoe float, right? So we've made we've made two so far, and here in uh, in, in in Europe, it seems to be a a popular uh, pastime for engineering students to do concrete canoes. So there's several concrete canoe races in in wow. Europe. Yeah. So every year, uh, literally every year, teams from different countries in Europe come together with their concrete canoes to push innovation in concrete. So um, you have concrete, I think the, the lightest one in the previous competition was about 80 kilos and the heaviest one, the first time we did it was 450. Um, wow, that's fascinating because yeah. the combination of being waterproof and also light has so many applications for 3D printing. Yeah, and so ours was heavy, <laughs> very, 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 very heavy. Uh, so but I don't think there's going to be much market in that. It floated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It floated wow. fine. So as you put, if you displace enough air, it, it'll float. <laughs> so we just made a really big one, right? And, 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 and we really, you know, we, we use it now every year we do it. We were doing it again this year, but because of the crisis, it was canceled. Yeah, that's and we use it now kind of to milestone our progress in the company. Um, so, you know, the first project we did was a three months of hard work, 450 kilo canoe. Um, with you know ten people having to work full time and you know putting sand in between to get the layers to to stand up, and the second one we did we did within a week. Um, it weighed uh, half and less. We used two three people to do it, so you, you see like uh, improvements, right? So that's yeah, definitely. That's yeah. So, what do you think are the next projects that you're going to be printing? So uh, the big project we're doing right now is, is the, the house. house. Yeah. So that's, that's, we started with that again, when I started my company, we had done, uh, we had got together with the project and decided to do the house. So it's been, it's been quite a while in development now, a year and a half. Um, and we're doing the first prints. Uh, you can see behind me some test prints done already. Okay. Uh, and what we're really focusing on there is, is, you know, the form freedom, uh, the more of the architectural side. So most of the houses that have been printed right now are straight walled. Yeah. Uh, which, which is, you know, a good strategy for sure, especially for some of the larger uh, construction um, techniques out there. But we focus more on the architecture side. So we're doing more of a free form type house. That's the idea. So that's a big project doing now. Um, but interestingly, there's other things we're doing. We're working with an American company, uh, several, uh, another consortium, as, uh, you know, as you mentioned as well, doing um, suction anchors for floating wind farms. 
And that's an excellent example of a, um, like a rapid prototyping application for 3D concrete printing. Yeah. Right. So I guess that kind of brings me to my next question. Are you guys cash flowing right now or are all of your projects experimental? Um, it's, that's kind of, it's tough to answer. So there's, there's certainly, there's certain projects we do based on subsidies, right? So yeah. for example, the, the, the house we did, it's a typical example of, of, of getting a, um, uh, uh, subsidy here a local subsidy yeah that's fantastic uh, what's that that's fantastic yeah yeah, yeah. i mean the innovation climate in, in the netherlands and 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 elsewhere here is really quite good i mean i couldn't exist without the you know the government support for sure and i think most companies in the concrete printing business wouldn't exist without some type of government support so this type of project you get like the um the three suction anchors the uh the floating wind farm anchors um, those are those are paid jobs for us, right? So we're doing quite a lot of consultancy. Um, then we're also selling our software. So we have some jobs running in software, in support, and in training. Those things run. Um, for this year, we're actually, it could be a lot worse with the crisis. So we've done quite well last year to be able to sort, support ourselves this year. It's going to be a really, well, for us, quite a stellar year. Uh, but obviously, the crisis has put a halt to a lot of, projects for us especially the larger projects are really on hold um yeah so the question of cash flowing is in the crisis is always tough uh we're we're still doing we're, you know it could be a lot worse but the crisis has hit you know yeah i actually didn't even mean to relate it to that i kind of um it's great answer overall it seems like you guys are in a really good spot so the is there a version three of the printer that you are thinking about it all right now, or is you're still working on the pushing the limits of the version two? So uh, we started off, you know, as it, we started off with the printer behind me or in front of me, I should say behind you, uh, the experimental printer. And this is the one we got now to, you know, make larger objects. And what you see hanging on there right now is uh, our newest development, which is a new nozzle. So we started to experiment now with accelerate in the nozzle as well. So you see in concrete printing quite a divide, right, between uh, large scale construction and uh, smaller scale construction, to put it very simply. And the second uses some type of accelerant generally, right, if that's the phase. So we're in that phase now, we're developing our own nozzle with accelerant inside because our focus is more on the small scale architectural type models. Um, so you get um, the ability to make these, these smaller objects. Yeah, that's interesting. So you're printing on always a slab, right? Yeah. Yeah, basically. Someone approached me. Um, it was actually my father who doesn't know anything about engineering or 3D printing. Uh, he knows a little bit about construction. And he was saying, is there any way you can print not on the slab? Can you print the slab with a printer? And I know yours is a, is it a six axis printer? Mm hmm so it has a freedom of motion that would allow it if it had some accurate mapping of the grounds topography potentially to print a slab is that feasible yeah for sure so technically this is a seven axis printer because it's on the rails right wow okay so that adds a bit like a degree of motion yeah um, and then if you want to get more technical the new nozzle has even more axes but you know that's that's a bit beside the point um, we're actually doing a project now with um, uh, a company in Rotterdam as well, uh, friends uh, in 3D printing of foundations. So we believe strongly that one of the applications of 3D concrete printing is in topology optimization, which is like form finding optimization. Okay. Uh, where we actually, you know, for, for, for if you don't know, it's, it's where the computer can, can generate a design based on the minimum amount of material, right? So this is quite interesting for... Um, foundations as well because it's, it uses way too much material right we don't need yeah. that much material in the foundation but it's easy to pour and it's cheap um so there's always going to be this fight between price of you know poured concrete and 3d concrete printing uh, but there's this environmental and the environmental challenges is playing a real part there and in the printing of these these foundations this exactly this type of thing is going to play a role uh, like how are you going to go how are you going to use the uh, topology of the the terrain to print on top of that so it is possible um but in my opinion it's just early days right these things are optimizations and we're not ready for those yet 
Yeah, I mean, that's definitely an advantage that your printer probably has over some of the gantry style printers in its ability to navigate a wider range of topography. Yeah, agreed. Um, you do see some gantry printers now, uh, like the wire printers that are out there um, that, that are becoming better at that, or gantry style printers where a robot's actually hung on top or hung upside down to give them the extra degrees of freedom, right? Um, but it's, it's still tough. And, and again, the big discussion right now we're still having is, you know, on-site versus off-site. And in my opinion, bringing the robot on-site is generally has, has more disadvantages than it does advantages. That's wow. where gantries are more interesting. But uh, it's, it's a discussion. It's, it's not been, it's not been uh, fought out yet. Who's, who's, who's going to win on that side? Yeah, I guess the major disadvantage is that you can't control the environment as much or really at all. Um, and it's expensive to transport. But if you can locally source the concrete mix, um, then the net weight that you're transporting could be a lot less if you're bringing the printer to the job site. Um, yeah, for sure. I personally like the idea of bringing the printer to the job site. So my next question is, what's the easiest way for you to transport your printer? Uh, so this one, um, basically what the easiest way to do this is, is really quite simple. Is you build a um, metal base for the printer where okay. you can have two forklift uh, uh, positions. Just put it, on, put it on the truck. And I have transported these, obviously, to get them here from where we were first. Uh -huh. And it's not that hard. So the transport itself is not even, it's not even the biggest issue. You can transport these robots uh, relatively simply. Uh, the problem is when you get there, right, it's the environmental conditions. You start building a tent, you start building a mini factory on location. Um, because we're still, we're, still we're still trying to figure out how to get this process well under control before we can start experimenting with, you know, just going outside and printing and seeing what happens. Yeah, definitely. I'm sure there's so much experimentation and innovation to happen in this industry for sure. I mean, I think that people realize that if it was already enormously easier and faster and cheaper than traditional construction, it would probably have exploded by now, but the technology is still in development. And so some people are wondering like, okay, if it's so great, then why aren't every, why isn't every new house 3d printed? But that's cause it's not like, like the Tesla was so great, but not every car is electric even now. And the Tesla has some of the best ratings of all the cars on the market yet obviously there's still so many gasoline cars sold and other companies are still struggling to catch up. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, you guys are on the cutting edge doing the important innovations and development that it seems like the industry needs. Yeah. I think what you really, what I, what I learned from before. So I, I never, I didn't start in concrete printing per se. I was more into um, uh, plastic printing, right? Polymer. Cause that was more accessible as a, a private citizen, so to say. Okay. Um, so I bought a small printer myself at home, you know, started experimenting. And then I, and I introduced a lot of 3D printing in my company, uh, my previous company in automotive. Um, and you got to draw a lot of parallels between the 3D printing industry uh, in plastics and, and steel and all their metals and other materials and concrete. So the, you, you can see the same trends. So you, that's, it's quite interesting to look at the trends in 3D plastic printing, for example, and to see how long it took to get more mainstream. Right. And still many articles I read about 3D plastic printing, they're saying, why is it not mainstream yet? Why is it not mainstream yet? First of all, it takes time. I noticed a lot with the engineers I worked with that it's very difficult to change their way of thinking about how to um, think in 3D. Right. Think from the design before the application. And if you're going to apply that to construction, that's, you know, it has another degree of difficulty. So I understand why construction companies are taking quite a while to adjust to the technology. It's yeah, not to mention the municipalities and permitting uh, regulations, stuff like that. Exactly. exactly. It's going gonna, it's gonna to take a, a very long time to... Um, interestingly, what you see here in the Netherlands, for example, we have, we have um, one of the um, municipalities here um, is starting to uh, put out um, jobs specifically for concrete printing in order for themselves to learn how they can um, source this type of technology. So they're... They're basically practicing themselves by by sending out you know requests for bridges or for other objects to see what's coming at them so they're training themselves kind of internally to get used to this technology 
and that's music to my ears, right? To see that there's initiatives coming that are that are aware that it's hard for them to understand what it is, and that's why they're trying to figure it out. Yeah, it seems like you have a very forward-thinking environment over there. Yeah, I hope so. Yeah, we're part of it, right? That's it. <laughs> we get to be part of it. That's 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 quite good. It surprised me a little bit that um, the United States has less initiatives than Europe, and the Netherlands, for some odd reason, we haven't really necessarily figured out why we have quite a lot of 3d printing concrete initiatives right so there's four commercial companies uh four maybe maybe a fifth even and then there are three universities that are working on it um, and it's quite a small country so so when you look at the parallels to for example the united states it's quite difficult to assess why there isn't an explosion of startups in the u.s for example on concrete printing yeah it is interesting what are the labor costs like in the netherlands no, no different than than probably no different than the United States, if not a little Getting bit more. Getting quite expensive. high. Yeah. So, but it's, it's not like it, yeah, it's high, but it's not it's not Switzerland high, right? So, um, automation is definitely um, there's definitely a desire for automation here. Uh, we definitely don't have cheap labor, but it's not so high that everybody needs to jump ship, right? It's not that high. Yeah, a lot of people talk about jobs being lost to automation whatever and first off there's so many new jobs i see even in comments of videos sometimes people will stand up for automation when people try to attack it um because first off people are building the printers people are maintenancing the printers um tons of other jobs are created from that and also a lot of these labor jobs aren't being taken up by younger people so people that are graduating college and people that are graduating high school, they're not going to trade schools as much as they used to. And they're not wanting to work with their hands. They're trying to go into service jobs. A lot of them want to have a desk job, maybe related to engineering or technology or coding. Um, so as the labor force decreases in construction, it's not just going to become cheaper to use this technology. It's going to become necessary when there's no other way to build. Agreed. And if you want to have the discussion about um, the robots are taking our jobs, you got to look at the automotive industry, right? So one of my main motivations and one of the reasons I feel confident that this market is going to succeed or that this industry, this business is going to succeed is that when you look at the value added per worker um, in the automotive and in other sectors as well, it has increased, uh, I wouldn't say exponentially, but significantly over time, whereas construction has been stagnant. Um, or even decreased, right? So you got to look at what happened in automotive. And in automotive, there's a lot of robots. I can tell you, a lot of it's automated, especially when, especially in the larger companies. It's and it has to be automated, right? Because of the volumes that are coming out there. Yeah. Um, and they, there you see, it's not like there are less jobs in the automotive industry, right? It's not like it's not like there'd be so many more people working in the automotive industry if there weren't uh, robots. We just have very different looking cars. Right. And not better cars. I can tell you that as well. The cars wouldn't be better if the robots weren't there. Right. Uh -huh. So you, you got to look at you got to look at the trend in automotive motion, et cetera. And and that's really that's really the pain. Right. We're not going to lose jobs in my you're going to lose some types of jobs, but you're not going to lose jobs out as, a, as a whole. Uh, you're going to have different jobs, um, but the quality is going to increase as well. So you had your job working for the car manufacturer and you saw 3D printing. You bought a printer. Uh, which printer did you buy? I bought a Dutch printer called the Ultimaker, um, quite well known. Um, and uh, the reason I bought it actually was because we were doing a large project um, to build a new press line, automotive press line. And I'd never, I'd, I needed to have like, like a, a model and like a visual person. So I wanted to make a scale model. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, you have a huge budget, but no, no money for a tiny model. So I said, okay, I'll buy one myself. So I bought one off eBay or our version of eBay and uh, started printing and suddenly I had to teach myself to draw in 3D, which is weird. And then I had to yeah, teach myself yeah. how a printer worked and how uh, motors work and how you know the plastic works, how heating works, how the heated bed, all that. And ended up making a model of my, um, the, the big project that I was doing and noticed that that was that the first time I produced like an egg cup, you know, you produce trinkets. I was, I was blown away, right? The first time I ever produced yeah. a tiny little, little egg cup, I was like, that was it, that was it, I was sold. Um, so I had a similar first that. experience. I, had, I bought a cheap 3D printer online after I saw a video of some company that was 3D printing a house. I got really interested in 3D printing. Um, so I bought this Anet printer 
that was two hundred dollars and it came with the wrong parts and pieces i bought it on some weird website uh and i tried to put it together and i was just struggling with it for uh i don't know maybe 12 hours between three days and realized some of the pieces didn't fit properly so i went with a mechanical engineering friend of mine who had access to a lab in our school and cut some of the pieces up to barely make it work. And it was supposed to print like the demo model was Shia LaBeouf's head for some reason. Mm -hmm. It printed like a bunch of spaghetti. So I took the printer apart and I returned it. And fortunately they gave me a full refund and I bought a Prussia MK3 Very nice. in parts. And so assembling that one, everything came perfectly. And obviously the instructions were way better. And that was a much better experience. And I think the, the failure of the A-Net helped me build the pressure right the first time too. Yeah. So I started printing like you did, little trinkets and stuff. Personally, I really don't like plastic. And so that was always a huge drawback of me for 3D printing. But in concrete, you have something that's much more lasting for I guess plastic lasts a really long time, but you're not going to build your home out of plastic. Um, no. I guess even to build a home out of concrete, it's not maybe the best material, in my opinion. Are there any other materials you're exploring with? So it's interesting you say that, and on the based on the plastic as well. When I started, it was plastics as well, right? Because it's it's easy to start in plastics and small scale. And then I was inspired by some um, by a Dutch designer called Dirk van der Kooi, who used uh, his ABB robot as well um, to print in a large scale, right? That's how I got into the whole thing. So I wanted to start a company in 3D printing of plastic on a large scale with a large robot. Oh, wow. Um, but uh, it, it didn't happen that way because the companies came and they wanted to start with concrete printing. So I started to run with them and then discovered concrete because I had never worked with concrete before. Um, and in the meantime, we did start up the plastic project because I'd already bought a large scale um, plastic welding uh, machine, big, big plastic welding machine. Okay. So we did end up um, taking that apart and rebuilding that to, to produce plastic on a large scale with these robots as well. And we produce now with uh, recycled household plastic. So we have a company here that recycles plastic that people sort at home. And it's ground down to you know the pellet size, and it's 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 pure filth. It's the like the lowest grade plastic we have. Yeah. So we're able to produce with that. Uh, but I agree with you. I don't see a market in construction for it. It's it's hard to see what the applications are. So we have the technique, um, and we're looking beyond concrete as well to some other techniques that apply to construction because the basis of this technique applies well to other areas, right? be it brick laying or, or um, cutting of materials, you know, it, so they're, they're, we're looking beyond it as well. But the focus right now is on concrete. Yeah. Once you have the system ready for concrete, it can take any liquid filament kind of, I guess. Some companies are, no? No. Uh, in my, in, from my experience, like the plastic machine has, has nothing to do with the concrete machine. Other I than have that no robot. experience, so I'll take your word for it. Right, so yeah, it's, it's a completely different thing. So the, the one machine you enter with, with pellets and you heat the material and you extrude it, right? Um, um, a thermoplastic material, and with concrete, it's different. You pump the material. You pump what the material. other materials like a geopolymer? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's interesting, right? That's, you're, you're getting into discussion of how sustainable is this entire industry. Um, and geopolymers is like one of the solutions to that, right? You hear coming back a lot. And we developed our own concrete material. That's how we were able to get started. Um, but of all the different areas, so you have robotics, you have software, you have the printing, you have um, design, um, you have material. We decided not to focus on material. There are other companies that do this better. Yeah, absolutely. It requires quite specific knowledge. Yeah, definitely. You can't focus on everything. Nobody was going to be able to do that. No. Uh, that's why it's great that there's so many different companies that are contributing in different aspects. Yeah. Is there any relation to between Vertico and a company called Rohaco? Yeah, there is. So Rohaco, um, you might have seen on the website that Rohaco produces uh, the machine in the TU in Eindhoven. So they were the first to build, a, or one of the first to build a very large gantry. Um, and I they saw that gantry design. They had the yellow gantry style printer, and then I saw a different video where they had an orange six-axis printer. 
Exactly. So the yellow style one was one of the drivers in the Netherlands for the development, right, of concrete printing, one of the drivers. Um, and they're a company that builds automation solutions. Um, so they're extremely good with uh, the mechanical side of things, but they had no experience in pumping or concrete printing. So um, I knew them and I said, I can provide you with the concrete printing support. So the second machine they built was for Swinburne in Australia. That's the big red orange one they built, uh, six axis as well. So I provided the concrete pumping and the design, uh, the code and the 3D printing experience. So they do the mechanical side and I do all the wet side, so to speak, and the design. Okay, wow. So you had a huge influence in that project. Uh, listen, they, they, did, they, did mo they did all the work. I ended up um, applying my printer, pumping right? experience. Yeah. Supply we, we, printer is a big part of the job. Yeah, so so in, um, well, we supplied, they had the pump, they knew what pump to use already, so we supplied our own pump as well, which we'd like to use it, and we basically did the factory acceptance test for them. So we were able to help them with the factory acceptance test. And then we ended up printing one project on that machine as well, um, just to try out if we can do it on a larger scale. But um, I, we, we helped with the factory acceptance test and some of the code. So concrete pumps have been around for a long time. Uh, but most printer companies develop a custom concrete pump to go with their yep. printer. What's the major benefit to having one that's made for the printer versus any old concrete pump? It's, it's, it's another good question. Um, in my opinion, the producers of pumps are lagging behind. So there's a few worldwide um, that are slowly catching on to the concrete 3D printing market. Um, but by far not fast enough, right? So what ends up happening is you end up tinkering with your own machine. So you end up putting um, your own control over your pumping speed. You end up um, having to put pressure uh, sensors that you put in your hose or you put in your nozzle or whatever, connect them to your machine. You want to connect your machine to the robot in our case, right? So you need to, you, we want to be able to um, send our information to the pump um, and tell it what to do and tell it how to adjust itself. So communication with the pump, for example, is a, is a very important thing and needs to connect to the, ro to the robot or to the robot controller in our case. That's something that these, pump, these pumps just don't do, right? These pumps are on the construction side. They're not meant to be, first of all, they're not meant to be um, uh, adjusted by, by very tiny amounts, right? They're not made for this. They're not meant to uh, pump this very um, tixotropic material, right? Not necessarily. So there's, there's a lot of things that we want it to do that it's not made for. And, and often what you run into is that there's, a, there's always a trade-off in concrete printing, right? You want material to be as stiff as possible, but you still want it to pump. And there's, there's, that's a very, very uh, difficult like, um, balance to meet that these machines just aren't made for, right? So what you end up doing is buying a larger pump and then adjusting that one just to get your material through there. So the, yeah, the so pump's like not made. it's a smart made. pump almost. What's that? It's almost like a smart pump. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And you see some pump manufacturers now start to um, uh, kind of push their products as, as, as being connective, right? You can plug a USB stick now into a pump and communicate with it or a USB cable. Um, but, you know, that's, that's just behind. We, we're much further than that. We're adding our own PLCs to the pump in order to control exactly what it does when, when you do it. A good example is um, in one of the most used pumps out there, the MTech uh, Duo Mix for concrete printing, um, the water percentage that you can add is still, you know, it's still changed manually. Um, first, one of the first things we did was remove that and put a digital sensor in there so we know exactly how much water we're adding, right? Because we need to, we need to be able to adjust that while we go. And if we want to change materials, right? So we used, because we're not bound to any manufacturer, any supplier of a material, because we developed our own, we've tried, I think six different materials, six different suppliers. Um, so we're able to save our settings to that material and then just use the next material and be exactly the same as the first time without having you know, the, the, the human factor, right? <laughs> to change our settings. So these things we, we have to change in our machines in order to make them run properly. I really like how you're focusing on small details that give you good long-term solutions rather than just figuring out a quick way to make it work and then printing a house as quick as you can. Um, yeah. 
even though I must say, to be honest, um, uh, I like that it comes across that way, but it's still a startup, right? So a lot of it's still um, quick solutions. So the, the nozzle we have behind now, that's a real long-term development. And the house as well, a lot of the details are, are, are really, they're really thought about. But a lot of the stuff we do is experimenting. So we just try it and we try it and we try it and we, we hit this wall, right? So it's, it's, it's learning by doing a lot of the time. So it's, it's a real balance. Like how, how much can we do uh, in planning, like you said, the right way? <laughs> and how much are we learning? For example, like the, the, the glass ball technique that we used, that's all, that's all forced learning, right? Look, we want it to go this angle. How are we going to do that? Just fill it with sand, right? Fill it with sand, fill it with sand so it doesn't fall. And then you realize after a while that sand weighs a lot. So you start finding something that's lighter than sand. And then you, you keep hitting these walls. So it's, it's, it's both at the same time. I think a lot of engineers will be able to relate to you right now because you're yeah. describing the <laughs> yeah. engineering process. Like, yeah. make it work, make it work, make it work. And even when it's working, make it work better. So, yeah. Yeah. It's, I think it's got to be in you to, uh, to want to keep improving these things. That's what, I, that's what I loved about engineers too in the automotive as well. It's one of my favorite departments to work with because an engi the engineers, they, 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 if you ask them a question, they were always open to a solution, right? They, they always wanted to solve the problem. And that's such a great basis for, for innovation, right? It's just an attitude of, okay, fine, there's a problem. It, it must have a solution, right? I want to print this at this angle. It, okay, what's the best way to do it? Then it must be possible. So that's, that keeps you driving forward, right? We want to print a house that we want to print a skyscraper. Theoretically, it must be possible, right? Like, what do we need? And then you keep pushing that. So that, that works really well. Yeah, I guess theoretically, it's almost similar to philosophy, in that you're you have like a driven purpose in what you're thinking about and you're trying to reach some goal so even though they're two so different concepts um i guess in some of the problem solving aspects they share some similarities yeah so uh, not to get too much into that but one of the things that a degree like philosophy helps you with is it's very good at zooming in and zooming out right what's the big picture okay what's the detail okay zoom back out what's the big picture what's the detail and then in this trial and error type thing, you really need that, right? Okay, so today we learned these four things and tomorrow we got to zoom back out and say, okay, what does that mean for our process, right? So it's, it's a lot of zooming in, zooming out. And that, that really helps. And, um, uh, and it is needed as well. In a startup like this, you need to be and engineer and design and uh, sales and, right? You need to be like a uh, generalist, right? That, that needs to help. Yeah, definitely especially as an entrepreneur, I think all entrepreneurs are kind of generalists in a way. Yeah. Yeah. I think so too. I think, I think I, I've seen entrepreneurs as well that aren't, that have a very specific background and um, the danger then uh, is that you get, um, there's blind spots, right? There's blind spots. You need a, you need a strong team of different, um, different backgrounds, different capabilities, right? And, and at some point, at some point here too, once we grow to a certain level, there's going to be things that, um, uh, I need to have somebody that has a specific experience in that, right? Be it finance, be it sales, be it engineering. At this point now, with the nozzles we're doing, I see that this is a level of engineering is involved. That's not my background, right? So we're getting a lot of engineering support now. We're hiring engineers or we're having part-timers come in to do this more hardcore engineering work, to do it well, you know, as you said Certainly. before. So you really got to, at, at this point now, when we're growing, we've got to start pulling in like proper expertise to, to get it to the, to the right level. Yeah, so it's very clear that at this stage, you're really focusing on the technology, getting it the best you can. Um, I don't know how much thought you put into it yet, because I'm sure you're so focused on improving the technology, but what's the like kind of long-term vision? So if you have this printer and proprietary software that goes with it, then where do you fit in the market? Are you providing that software as a subscription to construction companies? Are you providing the printers? Are you renting the printers, selling the printers? Where, what's your plan? I know that it could change any day. You might have to pivot or find something that's more profitable. Right now, what are you thinking? So I did um, in our pitch deck, for example, we're now, we're now uh, talking to investors as well to grow the company. There was an interesting divide I made, or for me, it was insightful between, I was plotting the different 3D concrete printing companies in the world on two axes. One is uh, construction and architecture is one of the axes. And the other axis is printing versus um, uh, selling machines, right? So you have, for example, a company like Cobot, it sells machines. It will not provide you a printing service. Whereas, for example, 
the bum here in the Netherlands will print something for you, but you can't buy their machines, right? So these are two opposites. Yeah. And on the other section, you have construction and architecture, in my opinion. And on the one side, you have construction companies like, let's say, Icon or, or, or Appiscore, right? Um, they, do, they do really focus on housing and construction. On the other side, you have architecture, maybe uh, an X3 uh, slightly, or, or us, right? So we're very much on the architecture side. But because we are, um, uh, we're not affiliated in any way to any other company, we can do both sell printers and um, print for you, right? So we're quite free in that, as you said, can you pivot? So what you see with companies like ours, uh, and there are other startups like ours, um, you can buy their printers, you can buy their software usually, or license their software, and they will print for you as a service as well, or do consultancy, right? So they're, they're, they're very flexible. Um, and it, it, it varies a lot. So at some point, sometimes we have a lot of um, requests for our printers. At other times, it's a software. At other times, it's, it's, it's a printing process, right? So currently, we offer all these services because we can and we want to. You want to also refer the industry and make uh, some money doing it. Um, but at the same time, our long-term vision is uh, to produce more products. So we're more product-driven. Um, we like to produce um, and the machine itself, we want to optimize it and be able to sell it for others to also print with. Um, but uh, there is certainly a focus on producing actual end products with the machine. This is definitely a hard question. Um, and if you're nowhere near answering it, I understand. But do you have any idea what the price of your printer might be in like three to five years when maybe it could go on sale? Uh, so it is on sale. We have the, the, our printers are on sale for sure. So we have oh, wow. requests as well. We have, yeah, yeah, yeah. We have three different, uh, machines. We have our small machine, which is an R and D printer, um, which is a small scale one. Um, that sells for approximately, I'd have to, uh, I don't know, I have to like convert to dollars, but you're looking at approximately $40,000. That's for the small R and D printer. Okay. And for the larger machines, you're looking at a starting price of about a hundred thousand dollars. Um, but then that's, that's really your basic, your basic machine. When you start adding the two component nozzle and maybe some different pumps, et cetera, there's some options that you can add. You're looking at approximately 150,000. So that's, that's ballpark, right? Depending on what you need and where it's going. And you know, there's, there's quite a few things that are involved in that as well. Um, so that's, that's basically your ballpark, which is, um, which I guess is good for, for people on your channels to kind of hear and feel what these printers cost. The, and the question on the long term is, it's difficult. So what I have noticed is that um, once you get the right suppliers, the price goes down significantly, right? In the beginning, you get sold for the highest price. Yeah. And suddenly, you know the right people, the robots you can get at a better rate, the pumps you can get at a better rate. So our prices have really come down to what they are now because you're able to get the right suppliers, right? Um, so they will come down, but at the same time, a robot is a robot. So even in the automotive, it's not like those prices have been dropping forever and ever. A robot is still an extremely high, well-manufactured piece of equipment. That's where your, your highest costs are. They're not going to plumb it to 10,000 euros, right? This is, a, this is a very impressive machine. So I don't know how much they'll drop. Yeah, $150,000 seems like a very fair price to me, especially given the environment and the capabilities of your printer. If somebody yeah. wants to buy one, how, what's the best way for them to do that? Um, email me <laughs> for sure. Um, so what I always suggest is when you, when you are interested and you want to get a quote, for example, explain a little bit about the project you want to do, right? Where are you coming from? Do you want to start printing houses or do you want to do it for R and D purposes? Are you a concrete supplier? For example, we have that a lot of interest for our smaller R and D printer comes from either concrete suppliers who want to experiment or universities, right? A lot of interest from universities as well. The larger machines, what do you want to do with it? You want to make um, a promotional project? In which case you want to start, you know, you want to start some engineering consultancy as well, or do you want to learn for yourself what the innovation can bring to you? This you got, you got to think about beforehand. Um, but the easiest way is to just jot that down. Hey, look, I'm interested in these printers because ABC, what can you do for us? And then I can say, if you want me to print a skyscraper for you, this isn't the right technology. My machine isn't the right technology, right? You need a gantry machine or something of the like. There are some things in the market that are going to do that. So you got to you got to provide some some of your need, right? Some of your want before I can say, okay, this is the right machine for you. 
And for us, this is the right machine for sure for people that want to start in construction 3D printing. Start with a robot, right? Don't, don't go full scale, 10 by 10 gantry. You know, it's, it's a quite a large investment. You can start with a robot to get them pumping knowledge, to get the uh, tixotropic knowledge, to get all the software knowledge, et cetera. You know, it's a good, it's a good in. So you get the small R&D printers or the big ones. It's a very good way to start with concrete printing for sure. Yeah, which I guess the smaller, cheaper one is probably more popular. Uh, it, it depends. So you see those, what I said, you see those are popular with, um, for example, concrete producers or suppliers or um, because they're not interested in the objects, they're interested in the, in, the, in the material itself. And in the end, the pump is almost more interesting for them than the robot itself. Okay. Uh, because the robot won't give you a certain, you know, it'll make you, it'll print your object for you. Um, but the added benefit of a large robot is more a design than it is in material, right? It has nothing to do with material. It has to do with your volume or design, right? Um, so it's that and university. So these are real R&D type situations. If you want to go application, then the larger ones are more popular. So the house that you're planning on building, what's the size of that house? Uh, so we haven't completely settled yet. And um, uh, the, the details are will be published, but not right now. Yeah, sure. Um, but we're, we're looking at uh, approximately four by 10 by four meters, right? So it's yeah. quite, it's, 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 not a, it's not a mansion, but it's, it's, it's also a proof of concept, um, but it's quite large. Uh, like, like the Icon, like many of the first projects that are starting, you know, like Icon or, or, or Cobod, right? So it's the small scale first house. Yeah. So we're going to print it in parts as well, because it's obviously going to be done by the robot. Um, so we have designed it such that we can print it in sections. Um, and that's, that's uh, hopefully within two, three months, the first uh, images will, will be published. Yeah, and it's, you were saying you're going to try to incorporate some angles in the horizontal angles, vertical angles? Yeah, so um, I'm going to keep that to myself only because I don't want to promise anything that I can't then deliver, right? Definitely, I always definitely. got to be careful there. Um, but let's just say that, you know, we do specialize in the weird angle. So there should be some interesting things coming. Um, but there's more than that. There's more technical innovations in the house as well. We work with a, a very good uh, designer, robot engineer and constructors that had some interesting ideas to add to the concrete printing. But um, once we reveal, uh, we'll do another video. Would yeah, you? absolutely. That would be terrific. <laughs> Someday I'd like to make a trip over to the Netherlands and actually see your printer working in person, but who knows when that's ever going to be able to happen. Yeah, so we had this digital digital 2020, digital concrete here in Eindhoven, right? This, this huge symposium that was coming. Yeah. Um, but, you know, owing to the crisis, nobody's going to book a flight right now. Uh, and it was a real shame because that, that, that would have been a real, like, uh, I was there two years ago when it was held in Zurich. And that was a real, you really saw that was like, a, there was a starting point there for the industry, right? So I was really hoping to see that again this year to get everyone together and just to, just to, just to experience how large it has grown, right? Um, because, you know, we've been doing it for two years now, following this daily for two years now, and it, it has grown significantly. I started out with sheets, with some PowerPoints, with a couple of competitors in different countries, and I can't list them all anymore. Yeah. It's just, I, I can't even keep up, you know? Luckily, people like you are stepping in to make videos and adding, you know, stuff for list. But I just can't keep up at how many companies and how many different countries are starting up in this project. It's incredible. Yeah, it's also amazing how different they some of them all are. Yeah, agreed, agreed. It, it's fun to see uh, from even here in Holland. We have a, a, a power a powder a printer as well, like a concrete powder printer or the Andini style, uh, or you have the the so liquid, you know, inside this gel. It's all all weird concrete printing applications. Um, but generally, you do see the FDM style large scale still popping up. But there are definitely differences, as, as there should be, for sure. There are cool companies coming out. So how much thought have you put into the electric and plumbing of a house that would be 3D printed? I, I, to be honest, it's not my, again, it's not my area of expertise, right? So um, first of all, I'm not from the construction industry, so I don't have this, this pre-knowledge um, set to think about that, which in some in many, many cases, in many, many situations, it's a blessing, right? I don't get bogged down with these types of details. Yeah. Um, on the other side, it would be nice to, um, you know, be ahead of some of these things. 
uh, but these discussions they always happen, right? You, you know, it's one of the it's one of the typical questions as well. Like, how are we going to integrate those things? Um, my answer, short answer, is let's do a house first, and then backtrack, see what we do wrong, and then do another house. So uh, I don't know. I'm not sure how it's going to happen yet. I think a lot of traditional techniques are still going to be applied. Yeah, I don't think it's a huge challenge. Um, basically, it could be very similar to just CMU construction, how they do electric and plumbing for that. But I was just asking, maybe there was something uh, different that you had in mind. Obviously, you're way too I don't know what CMU printing. is. Yeah. What is printing, CMU? What's, oh, sorry. Concrete masonry unit, like a cinder block. All right. Okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah. I, some other companies have tried to mirror CMU construction to get past permitting regulations. I know in America, it's tricky, permitting especially. Um, do you have any permitting involved in the house you're printing or are you just trying to get a house built? Um, some, so we did, we, it was one of the discussions for us as well. Like, okay, so how are we gonna do this? Cause there's a house being printed now in, in Eindhoven, the milestone project, I'm sure you're aware. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, they do a lot of work on this permitting too, right? So one of their goals is to be able to actually permit it. And there's a lot of value in that, right? I fully understand that. Um, but it's it's like the permit area as well as another um, rabbit hole that a lot of large construction companies and um, other people have a lot of experience in. So it's not something I'm going to add a lot of value in at the moment. So right now we're really focusing on printing the house more as a showcase um, than for it to be livable because, as I said, it's not our added value in this market. Yeah, definitely. That was almost a loaded question because no company has a residentially permitted house yet. <laughs> So I wasn't expecting you to say, oh, yeah, we have the residential. Yeah, here we go. Yeah. That would have been, yeah, I'm sure you would have told the someone. That that the project in Eindhoven, right? So we work a lot with the technical university here because they have a department that's excellent in this, in this field. And this is really one of their added values, right? That's why I really like that they have positioned themselves in the market as well to do this. It really is one of their added values to figure out the, the, the permitting thing. And they really do have a... a a project, you know, the project milestone that's going to be lived in, right? That's going to be permitted, et cetera, et cetera. That's their goal. So I'm really looking forward to that. Yeah, I think it's good that you're staying concentrated and not spreading yourself too thin, worrying about all the different intricacies. Uh, there's so many different things to be done. And I'm sure like printing the house, once you get that milestone, then the permitting becomes a real question because then they can go and see the house and say, well, is it still standing after a couple of years and yeah. all that stuff? So, yeah, I mean, I don't see anybody getting a permitted house before the next three to five years, but maybe I could be totally wrong about that. No, no, there's a lot of, there's, there's a few companies, you know, including, for example, Icon or, you know, the US or um, uh, Episcore or, you know, you name, name them um, that are really spearheading this issue, right? And I think you're right that at some point, saying and focusing on a permit saying that you're getting a permit yeah for people that really are in the industry there's always some doubts about that um with, with for good reason but some people need some some companies need to spearhead this um and i'm glad they are right and i'm glad you know once we do the house we'll follow suit right and they've figured out the worst problems and we'll follow suit and you saw that as well with the the project here milestone it's similar they they they, they already started to hit some snags in the permitting um, side and they've actually written um, papers as well. Um, and they've, they, they've, they've had experience in this and have shared the experience of, okay, if you start on permitting, start here, 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 here. So they're, even the university here is already doing research on how you can pass through these hoops, right? And as I said, some of the munis municipality here in Eindhoven as well, or in the Netherlands, is actually um, uh, writing these tenders themselves to figure out for themselves how they're gonna get through this permit issue, right? So. So it's got to be a two-way street. So I'm glad that there's also municipalities that are working on this as well. So anybody watching this from a municipality in any other country, you, it's, it's on you as well to pull these companies into the market and get them to do what you want them to do in terms of, in terms of permit, you know? I don't have a lot of experience with the American government, but I just feel like there's very little chance that they're going to help yeah. um, the construction technology industry. Um, I guess American government tends to be pretty hands off with businesses and that can obviously that's not helpful 
when it comes to small companies that need to demonstrate their proof of concept still. Um, I guess that's why you see a lot more 3D printed construction companies coming from places like the Netherlands. Maybe, maybe, maybe. But they need a helping hand, right? Help them out. <laughs> Give them the support they need to grow this technology. And, and you got to create, you know, in some ways in America, the, 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 the venture capital side, the startup side is excellent, right? It's one of the best in the world for producing amazing startups. Another side, you have the, you know, the attitude we have here where we support the startups on a much, um, I would say smaller scale, but in a more, in a more government controlled scale. And it has its benefits also. It's the reason I'm able to do what I do. Right. Have you and done any international projects? Um, we do some consultancy internationally, but we haven't sent our printer international. Um, we have produced some projects. Uh, our previous project we did, one of the, the videos was in Berlin. So a designer from Berlin asked us to do a bench, which we produced for her. So that we produced. And other, other than that, it's been in the Netherlands. You said something about um, printing, when we were talking about the slabs, printing efficiently. Uh, I'm assuming that you're using some software to try to figure out how to minimize the, the print material if that's the if that's what you're doing. So could you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, can you give me one moment? To, oh, actually, I have a charger here. My phone's dead. <laughs> Wi-Fi. Um, so uh, this technology, it's called topology optimization, or it's one of the one of the words for this topology optimization. And there are softwares you can use to do this. There are different softwares you can use to do this. One of them is, is Abacus, and there, there are different styles. So there, there are, um, there's a, a software that companies use in 3D concrete printing. Mostly it's based on Rhino and Grasshopper. I don't know if you've come across this, but it's often based on Rhino and Grasshopper. And this is called the slicer. So how do we get a, geom how do we get a geometry to become uh, coordinates, and how do we translate those coordinates to our robot, right? So we have actually made this for ourselves and that we use, and this is the basis for our software, right? This material optimization software is separate. So this is really, um, you're doing this in a different software package when you design the object itself, right? So this is, this is an engineering thing and this already gets used in, um, in a lot of industries for light weighting for in, 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 in aerospace, for example, sure. um, alongside 3D printing as well, right? So a lot of these light weighting things you see in steel printing, for example, these are top topology optimized and we did a bridge with the University of Ghent in which we in which they optimized this bridge and then we printed it right that's the whole idea so so this software is is is, is really um, engineering software and not specifically 3d printing software so we don't have any proprietary software on topology optimization they're different packages they design for us and then we slice and print yeah there's no reason to reinvent the wheel there but do you have any uh, recollection of what the material savings were with that model versus how it would have been otherwise? Or I guess that's tricky to calculate. It, it is, but I've read the paper was recently published by um, uh, the researcher that led the project at the University of Ghent alongside some researchers from the TU Eindhoven. And he said there was a material saving in this bridge of 20%. Um, now I can, I, I, I believe that straight away. Um, it's maybe, it feels even on the low end because there's more possible. Yeah. Um, but it, that's already a significant reduction, right? In material, let alone in weight. Um, so that was this specific bridge we did, but there's definitely more possible there for sure. For sure. Are there any objects you've printed with that printer that you keep in your home? Uh, <laughs> that's an interesting question. Uh, yes. I have a small object. We did a small vase. One of the first objects we did um, before I even knew how to program the printer, we had a basic little square that I have. And I have some, uh, um, quite a few pieces that I keep outside for rain and weather tests to see, you know, what, what it's going to look like in two, three years, right? So yeah, we definitely. have a few objects outside just to see, because who else has the opportunity to do that, right? So we printed stuff two years ago. I took it home. It's now in or on the shed just to see what the material does in two, three years. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, there's some objects at home. That's a very valuable study happening on top of your shed. Yeah, maybe, maybe, but you know, at least you can say like, okay, um, if you, do you have any experience with the weathering of the concrete you printed? So yes, we have a few samples, right? I'm serious uh, when I say it's valuable. It's the, only, uh, it's the only test that we're gonna have for two years ago. Yeah, exactly. And even if it's, a, if it's not exactly very scientific, nobody has, or not many people have an older one, right? That's the, that's the thing and it's, and for you as an entrepreneur, 
you will know if it's not great how you can maybe improve it and stuff like that in the future. I, I still have that thing. We recently moved into Eindhoven and, you know, I had to put it on my new shed. Um, you'd be surprised at the, um, the quality that it retains. The color, I mean, it's been in, it's been in, 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 in freezing cold uh, more than once. It's been in all weather. It's outside. Um, I think if you put it on the table next to the freshly printed 3D concrete, not many people will tell the difference. It's, it's gone slightly darker, but, but really there isn't much of a difference. That's but that's not scientific, right? That's like, this is my own shed study. Uh, there's there's not, not much difference. Sure. So, is there anything that you would like somebody watching this video to go check out from Vertigo? Check out the site. So there's there's a lot of stuff on the site. Um, there's the machines we produce and uh, the projects we do. Check out the projects. I mean, it's, if you want to have a good experience, if you're new to concrete printing, check out the projects so that you can see what type of design freedom there is. Right? And if you want to get into concrete printing, check out the technology um, because we have some examples of the gantry printers that we, we help with the Rohaco and we have the, the, the machines themselves as well. For people that know a little bit more um, that are starting up in the industry, when I started um, the company, you know, we didn't use the Rhino Grasshopper model. We didn't have the right software. So I organized a hackathon um, in order to get a basis for the slicer. And because I organized a hackathon, we made it open source. So there's a video online of our basic software, open source. Um, so if you're still struggling, like how am I gonna get my code to the robot? There's an open source version now. And I'm running a project as well with uh, University of Saxon and a company in Amsterdam called Wideliners to bring a free version online as well. So you, hear the, you heard it here, here first. There's a free slicer software coming online, which will help you slice to large scale gantries and large scale robots that overcome some of the challenges that you have in, in, in um, small scale slicing software. It's gonna be free, it's gonna be fully online. So if you're into it already and need, need some help coding, check out these free things. If you're into it and want to see the technology, check out our technology page. And if you're into it to see what design possibilities are there and they are endless, check out our projects page. That's really cool that you guys are offering the software open source. I love when companies do that. It's a basic, so it, it, the basic, right? So the full version that we have, is, it's a lot of development yes, gone sir. into there. So we have a lot of, we fixed a lot of um, issues for the more complex objects, right? Like our seams or how we start and stop prints, etc. cetera. Um, but we basically started this open source part because um, with ourselves in mind from two years ago, right? We were struggling so hard to get the, proper code to the robot. We're using the small scale plastic printers, way too many coordinates. The, the robot was all jittery, you know, didn't know what was going on. And it took me a while to get the right software in. So I want people that want to start in this industry to get a leap, you know, to, to not start struggling at that point, but just be one step further. It's good that you're trying to promote the whole industry as a whole in that way. Yeah, I think that um, uh, we all do that by, by, by producing projects, right? The more projects we can push out there, the more acceptance you're going to get on a large scale. Everyone benefits from the promotion of other companies, right? Um, and I'm quite afraid in the market that at some point there are going to be companies that are in there that have started patenting some of their developments that are going to start squeezing the smaller or the newer ones out. Um, it, it's going to happen at some point, and I hope it doesn't. But you know, I'm afraid that the people that were there a couple of years earlier are going to start using these patents, you know, to, to squeeze out other competitors. Yeah, it's uh, interesting you bring up the patent thing. I saw in a video by um, a company, 3D Plotter, they, it was not <coughs> where they shot, but I guess they uh, found some footage of old patents. One of them was from 1944. Um, a guy 3D awesome. printed the house almost in 1944. You've seen it? Yeah, yeah of course. Wow. So yeah. I looked, I saw that patent and then I Google patents or Google Scholar or whatever allows you to see related patents. So I clicked on all the related patents and I had like 20 tabs open and I scrolled through and there's a bunch of different patents for automated walls, automated construction from the 1940s, the 1950s so many of them that are now expired so i don't know maybe some of them wouldn't be enforceable some of the newer ones aren't actually enforceable it's 
Agreed. Um, there are a lot of things we are developing now um, that are f fairly unique, like the the, um, uh, the two component nozzle, which kind of looks like a, it has a lot to do with the shot creep nozzle, but it's just adjusted differently, right? And a few companies have figured out how to do this now, and so we figured out as well. Um, but the question is, yeah, who, who got there first? Um, this is one of the examples, but gantry is similar, right? Are you going to patent uh, different gantry nozzles? I know there are gantry patents out there as well. Um, yeah, who's, who's going to want to enforce them? And a lot of these, these most, most of these small scale companies don't have the, the means to fight any of these, these patents, right? But, um, or get started in it whatsoever. But some companies focus heavily on it. Uh, it's part of their, 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 their strategy. Yeah, I really hope that problem doesn't come across too much either. Yeah, yeah, but be warned, right? If you're going to start a company in concrete printing, it's, there's there's a chance. Yeah, I guess this here's another kind of tricky question: Who are the people who don't want concrete printing to happen? Wow, there's a, that's that's one I have never actually thought about. Um, I don't know. I don't know. And I, even if they were there, I don't know if they could stop it. Um, I don't know. Maybe it, it's traditional manufacturers. It's it's a weird it's a weird niche, right? Uh, to get through. What like what are we as a concrete printing market? What market are we actually fighting? What are we replacing? Right? Is it precast? Is it is it is it traditional building? Is it timber? Is it brickwork? Like who who's threatened by us? I guess you'd have to analyze who's threatened by us. Yeah, that's a really good point, especially because architecture is so categorized all the time into different building styles. 3D printed construction is so unique, it almost doesn't cut into any of those traditional building styles as of yet. I mean, it's not a problem now because you don't see 3D printing dominating the construction market. Mm -hmm. Just from like to play devil's advocate almost, you have to look at who's going to not like the projects and there's always somebody who's going to not like the projects and i try to think about like who's going to try to stop it um for in my perspective it's maybe insurance companies who have higher premiums when there's more employees on the job site so if they if you reduce the number of people it takes to build a house from like 10 to 2 then maybe their profits go down a lot um and then the other thing I thought of was maybe some construction unions, but in places like the Netherlands in America where construction labor is on a downtrend, I don't see people really getting put out of jobs. And that's the only circumstance where they'd really not be happy with it. So I don't know. I agree with you. There's not too many people who have a reason to dislike automated construction as of now. So I don't, I mean, the question is, it triggers me on another one. Um, who feels threatened by concrete printing, I'm not so sure, but what are the threats to the industry? That is quite interesting, right? So one of the major threats to the industry is that one of us concrete printers is gonna produce something that's below par and that's gonna that's gonna collapse or that's gonna injure someone in the short term, right? That's that's a real threat to the industry. That's gonna set us back heavily. So I know many people that are quite concerned that um, if somebody does that, that's gonna set us back. So there are threats to the industry. I think this crisis we're having now is also a threat to the industry, right? A lot of, it's gonna put us, it's gonna slow us down at least. Um, other threats uh, are maybe digitization or automation of other processes in the construction industry, right? That replace concrete printing, uh, automated bricklaying or automated timber construction. I don't know, some things like that. Even That's though they may also point. help. You brought up, it's like the story of Icarus who flew too close to the sun. Mm -hmm. If they become too ambitious to print something and then if it's not actually structurally secure and there's an accident, um, yeah, that would be terrible. So I guess it's important that people are taking the proper steps and precautions. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's very important, right? And, and that's why you need, again, that's why you need a team with, with, with engineers as well from outside that do have the experience in the industry to be able to say, wait a, wait a minute, that's not how we do things, right? You got to take it slow when it comes to those type of steps. On the other hand, that's a threat to the industry, right? Because it means that our progress is a lot slower. Uh, but the trade-off is that we don't have these accidents because if we've had those, we'd be set back even more. Definitely. So what are, I guess, I didn't want to talk about the virus too much, but with people not wanting to go onto job sites and 
having technology that allows less people to be working and maybe people standing at a further distance from each other on the job is there has there been any um higher rate of people asking about your technology because of that or so i see the parallel right it makes sense and i think and at some point um that's definitely an argument there are other arguments like that right it's safety on the work side as well because you're not involved directly it's also um, labor conditions which is a very important argument as well when you start adding construction to the work side but in this case it's also right um it's also health health and safety right with a with a condition like this and certainly sure i see the parallel but at the same time um before this technology has really taken over the construction industry it's going to be a while we're all aware of this yeah right this is not the this is not the game changer for automating the construction site it's, it's one of the parts that's going to push us towards automation on the construction side, but it's not as if this is, so, it's not like um, Zoom, right? <laughs> who suddenly have, who suddenly got this major spike in business because of the way that we're now doing business uh, exactly as we're doing now, right? Over, the, over, the, uh, over the computer. So, so sure, I see the parallel, um, but I'm not going to sell uh, our printers with a unique selling point that you can have more distance on a work site if you buy our machine because it just isn't true at this so time. So you were you just saying you've seen a spike in business from Zoom? No, no, no. Zoom has seen a spike in business from oh, Corona. Okay. Yeah, 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 certainly. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say how did you get never mind. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. But it, it but it works. But so yeah, so the Corona has uh, it doesn't have an effect and in the end sure automation is it's one of the plus points of automation is that you can have distance agreed, but I'm not going to sell our machines as such at this moment. Yeah, definitely. So what projects are you working on right now other than the house? You're kind of, I guess, really focused on the design of the house at the moment. Uh, so the design is, is pretty much finished. We're, we now have the code almost ready. We have large parts of the code is finished. Uh, we're really in the production phase now. Oh yeah. So I wanted to ask, is it, does the slicer export G code? If you want, um, the, the online one, we're doing both G code and rapid code. So rapid for the ABDs and we'll be adding Fan Fanuk and KUKA later. Um, but you know, in basis, when you slice an object, you're going to produce X, I, Y coordinates. And this can very simply be translated to G code and then also translated to rapid code. So it can do both. Um, and then you can add different robots on there as well. And are you importing an STL file to the slicer or? You can. So anything you can, you can import into Rhino, you can then use as a, uh, for slicing because it's still Rhino based the slicer as most are. So all you have to do there is find out what imports best and why. So there are some file types that import worse or better than others. So export in that file type, but STLs do work. Yeah. If somebody is trying to make a 3d model to be printed on your printer, are, is there any advice you could give them in making it feasible? Yeah, so um, uh, be careful about how um, uh, ambitious you are in the, the form freedom. So the bench we just did for Berlin, for example, was extremely form free. And one of the reasons why we got the job is because we were able to use the STL as was without any changes. So that's <clears throat> the advantage of printing with all that support material which is layer intensive, but it can make you produce any form that you want. If you want to try something in 3D concrete printing, um, based on the, the normal machine, think in two and a half D. So your side's going to be straight and your top is going to be whatever shape you want, but your sides sure. are going to be straight or almost straight, right? Um, that's, that's how you want to start an object. That's how you want to start experimenting. Then you have obviously the two component nozzle in which you can start making much greater angles, right? Um, but be careful there that, for example, right angles don't work well. Uh, your angle shouldn't be much more than 45 degrees. Otherwise, you're going to need some support in most cases. So when you're using a two component nozzle, um, then you can go freer. Uh, but be careful that the first things you want to do is be aware that usually most concrete printers just print up straight. Yeah. It's hard. It's hard. And if you. <laughs> It's hard to design for concrete printing. It's hard to design for any 3D printing, right? You need to have done it a few times to understand what the kinks are, right? So, uh, for sure. Yeah, I'm not that great at 3D modeling myself. I've messed around in Google SketchUp a bit and Blender. I also took an AutoCAD class in college. So I've got fundamentals, but 
I guess I don't have the creative ability or the 3D modeling skill to really design my own house. So that part is really fascinating to me, how people are doing the digital design. And then I guess the really cool part is having a digital design or maybe even a catalog of digital designs that can be printed by a printer like yours. And when you have the list of what can be printed, after that point, you just kind of press go and then mm -hmm. you get the object. That's like what people want the technology to be, I think. Yeah, so um, one, one of the major trends is, so we talked a little bit about topology optimization, right? Which is shape optimization, which I think is a, a very important step in, in concrete printing. Uh, and I could talk much more about that, but another thing that's very important we focus on is something called parametric design. I don't know if, how much you are aware, and if, if you wanted to get into design for concrete printing, parametric design is a very interesting one. So. Some of the projects we did, uh, many of the projects we did, we designed such that the design itself isn't really made by hand, like in, for instance, Google SketchUp. Um, but we actually add code to the, um, the engine, to, to Rhino, that defines for us what the shape's gonna look like. So, you know, start with a circle, uh, increase the width, increase the height, uh, twist it by 90 degrees, then, you know, add another section here, twist that, make a pattern. So you get this parametric design. Um, one of the key uh, advantages of that is, is that your design is adjustable. So one of the projects we did in Enschede, the designer there, she had this parametric design. And by the time we were going to print it, it turned out that the job site itself, actually one of the walls was um, slightly shorter and one of the other walls was slightly longer. Classic and construction she, problem. Right, maybe, yeah. <laughs> so, so what you could do is just simply adjust two parameters, right? Which is the, the size of this wall and the size of this wall. And the entire object, which is quite complicated, which was all these interlocking shapes, changed within an instant, and the code came out at the same time, right? We had no more than you know, a couple hours of, of change time between adding these parameters and, and having our code ready to print. So just you know days before printing we could just adjust the entire model with very little with very little um, with little, little effort and this is one of the benefits of parametric design and it merges extremely well with this technology right so it's it's a digital design technique merged very well with the technology so parametric design is really really something to 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 keep your eye out for um it's very big in architecture already but it's going to really facilitate our um digital construction technology and, and also in concrete printing. So if you're into design of these things, check out the parametric design for sure. That's a fascinating use case that you just brought up. Um, it's all so the simple, time right? in construction projects, there's always unforeseen circumstances, whether it's a slab that might've been poured wrong or a wall that's a quarter inch from where it should be. Um, these issues happen all the time, uh, especially if you're doing like a retrofit of an old building and you're trying to make it look newer or something like that to have the ability with parametric design to make a quick quarter inch change to an enormous object ultimately yep. is incredible and something that traditional construction methods i can't think of anything that comes even close to offering that kind of versatility you know and then the link between between that example and um, one of the reasons why as i said before this is going to um, be a successful thing in the construction industry is if you reduce this 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 um, blunder time, or or as they say, right, you're going to increase the value added per worker, right. So if you don't need all these people to do all these changes and and have all these mistakes uh, fixed, you're going to increase your productivity. And this link is is so strong, right? You keep seeing it come back in digital manufacturing, in parametric design, or in optimization, or in changes, right? And and that's why it's going to be successful. There needs to be value at more value added in the construction industry. And this digitization is one of the things that's going to make it possible. Definitely. I think that's a good place for us to leave this conversation for now. Cool. I really appreciate that, uh, that you've given me this time to have this conversation. I talk about 3D printing to a lot of people and some of them are just my friends and family, but I'm not able to communicate it as, um, I'm not as deeply involved in it as you. So you're able to, talk on it in a way that's so involved and so like actually based in reality you got the printer right behind you so mm -hmm. a lot of people don't have the opportunity to have this conversation with you since i'm so lucky to i'm thankful that you've given me permission to put this on the internet so sure. now hopefully a lot of people will be able to hear this valuable conversation we've had um and personally i won't be able to remember everything you said and so it'll be great to be able to point to people to have 
video from a real expert instead of just myself. So thank you again. Yeah, it's, it's you know, for, for me, because it's my business, it's 3D concrete printing 24-7, right? That's, that's, that's what, I, what I do. So, and the good thing about these things as well is if you're in it for two years, uh, you're automatically an expert, right? Because it's such, a, it's such an innovation, right? It's, it's, it's only been around for, it hasn't been around for that long. So it's, it doesn't take that long to become an expert in 3D concrete printing. And if you, if you want to learn more, come visit us when, you know, all this is over. Come have a look. If you enjoyed this conversation, subscribe to my channel for more content related to automated construction and 3D printing in concrete. And until next time, stay safe and stay healthy.